All right, so for those of you who just joined, thank you for coming on to this SB Grid webinar, part of our kind of ongoing webinar series we hold throughout the year. We've been hosting these more or less since the COVID shutdown began, originally as a replacement for our intended on-site symposium, and now going back to our monthly uh, standard webinar series that we've been hosting for a few years now. You're probably already aware, but all of the talks, or at least the vast majority of them, will be uploaded to YouTube after uh, not moving a couple of days of the talk finishing. So if you want to catch up on any of the talks that have gone before in this series, just let us just log on to YouTube and look us up. Likewise, if any of you have any ideas for a talk you'd like to see as part of this series, from a methods developer or a cool biological story, let us know. You can either nominate yourself, nominate your friends, don't even have to tell them if you just want to send somebody and get us to get in contact. Yeah, anything you see that's interesting, we're happy to reach out to them and get them as a speaker. So today we're gonna to have Daniel Rapp from the University of Texas talking about some coronavirus work. And just to run you through how we've been hosting these things previously, if you have any questions at any point during the talk, send them through to the hosts in the chat. It looks like we're stabilizing in participant numbers. So I guess now I'll just introduce uh, Daniel Rapp from the Kellen Lab, who's gonna be talking about a bunch of different work as far as I can tell that has been happening over this lockdown period, particularly into the SARS-CoV-2 structure. Um, and yeah, this is very timely and it should be very interesting. So with that, uh, take it away, Daniel. All right, thanks very much. Uh, thank you all for being here and for SV Grid for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, my name is Daniel Rapp. I'm a PhD candidate in Jason McClellan's lab at UT Austin. And today I'm going to be telling you about some of the work that we've been doing over the past nine months or so to try to structurally characterize the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, and what some of the implications of our findings might be for therapeutic development and vaccine design. So just getting started with a little bit of brief background on coronavirus virology. Uh, coronaviruses have a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome, which is bound by the nucleoprotein N. Uh, that nucleoprotein then associates with the membrane protein M, which is embedded within the host-derived viral membrane. Uh, that viral membrane is then decorated by the spike protein, which is shown here. Um, and interestingly, the spike protein is actually how the coronavirus family got their name. Uh, early researchers who were looking at electron micrographs of intact viral, intact viral particles saw this sort of halo of protein surrounding the virion, and they thought that it resembled the solar corona. Uh, spike is a class one viral fusion protein, which means it's predominantly alpha helical, uh, and it's also a homotrimer in both the pre-fusion and post-fusion conformation, similar to the F protein from RSV or the ONV protein from HIV. Uh, spike can be divided into two functionally distinct subunits. The S1 subunit, which is shown here, is this transparent molecular surface. Uh, the S1 subunit is responsible for um, receptor binding, and it also plays a role as a fusion suppressive cap because uh, it sits on top of the S2 subunit, which is uh, shown as a ribbon diagram here. Uh, and the S2 subunit is responsible for mediating viral membrane fusion. Another really important characteristic of these class one fusion proteins is that they undergo dramatic conformational rearrangements from the pre-fusion to post-fusion state. And to try and illustrate that, I'm showing a single monomer of the S2 subunit here on the left in the pre-fusion conformation. Uh, it's colored according to these different uh, secondary structural elements. And you can see uh, from the pre to post transition or, or sort of uh, conformational change, a couple of these structural elements such as these red helices in the back or this orange beta sheet don't really change too much, but if you pay attention to these cool colored helices, the, particularly the green, blue, and cyan helices that make up the heptad repeat one, uh, as it goes from pre to post, these helices uh, stack on top of this purple central helix to form a single elongated alpha helix, which is characteristic of the post-fusion conformation. Uh, this post-fusion structure is extremely stable, and this stability drives membrane fusion. Uh, and it also drives the uh, metastable prefusion conformation to go to the post-fusion state. Uh, Spike is actually the largest known class one fusion protein. Uh, 
uh, a functional prefusion trimer is about a half megadalton in molecular weight. So until recently, structural characterizations of the spike protein were largely confined to X-ray crystallographic studies of individual domains. So for example, up at the top left here is the co-crystal structure of the SARS-CoV-1 RBD in green bound to its host cell receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, which is shown in red. Uh, similarly, after the MERS coronavirus outbreak, the MERS-CoV RBD was solved in complex with its host cell receptor, DPP4, or dipeptidyl peptidase 4, which is shown in yellow. Uh, and people have also successfully crystallized the post-fusion six helix bundle from both of these spike proteins, so SARS on the left and MERS on the right. Uh, so while these different structures are extremely informative, in the absence of a prefusion state of the full ectodomain to place these individual domains uh, in the context of what they would look like on the surface of the functional virus, uh, we're sort of in the dark. Uh, and that is where the advent of high-resolution cryo-EM became extremely useful. Uh, so in 2016, the first two structures of coronavirus spike proteins were reported back to back in the same issue of Nature. Uh, this one on the left is the spike protein from the human coronavirus HKU1, uh, which was reported by our lab in collaboration with Andrew Ward's lab at Scripps. And on the right is the spike protein from murin hepatitis virus, which was solved by David Wiesler's group at the University of Washington in collaboration with Felix Ray's lab. Uh, so it was really exciting for people in the field to be able to finally place all of these sort of disparate structural observations from past studies into the context of a full length spike. Um, and as you might expect, this sort of raised as many questions as it solved because people were trying to analyze how these things performed their biological functions. Um, the first thing that uh, one of our, uh, that our collaborators noticed when they were analyzing this structure, uh, here is the HKU1 spike protein. We're looking at it from a top down view. So here's the C3 axis of symmetry. And if you follow just a single protomer, so for, take for example this pink one, here's the N-terminal domain, and it's tightly interwoven with the neighboring protomers as it goes to this S1C terminal domain, which is thought to be the receptor binding domain. Uh, and as you can see, this receptor binding domain is packed tightly against the receptor binding domain from the neighboring protomers, forming this extensive trimerization interface. Um, and so, we were trying to figure out how this might work to bind a host cell receptor. Unfortunately, there is not a host cell receptor that's been identified for HKU1 yet, but by aligning the structure of the SARS-CoV-1 receptor binding domain to the receptor binding domain of HKU1, uh, we noticed that the ACE2, the host cell receptor, should be binding at this point here, whereas in our structure, the S1 CTD from a neighboring protomer was occupying this space. And to us, this suggested that in order for HKU1 to bind to a host cell receptor without forming significant steric clashes, it would have to undergo some conformational changes in order to allow that interaction to take place. Uh, and another reason why uh, solving these full-length spike ectodomains for the first time was really useful is because we got to understand the arrangement of the S2 subunit in the prefusion conformation. So I'm showing a single monomer of S2 here in ribbon. Uh, with the central helix now in orange and the heptad repeat one in gold. And our goal as a lab was to try to stabilize this S2 subunit in the prefusion conformation to make these proteins more easy to produce and also so that we could hopefully stabilize some of these proteins which we were unable to produce in the lab. Um, related spike proteins from MERS and SARS, which are also beta coronaviruses just like HKU1. So to try to accomplish this, a postdoc in our laboratory, Dr. Nanchuang Wang, uh, inserted proline mutations into this loop uh, connecting the central helix and HR1. The idea here being that the restricted backbone torsion angles of proline would disfavor the formation of the single elongated alpha helix, which is characteristic of the post-fusion conformation, therefore stabilizing the pre-fusion conformation. And fortunately, because of the relatively high degree of structural conservation in the S2 subunit between all these beta coronaviruses, he was able to identify homologous positions uh, from the HKU1 positions he first identified in both MERS and SARS. Uh, so he named these mutations 2P for the two consecutive proline mutations that he engineered. And when he tried to express them in lab, what he saw was a huge boost in expression relative to wild type. So I'm showing that here as a SEC chromatogram. Uh, if you look at the MERS-S wild type, this dashed blue line, which is barely visible down at the bottom, 
uh, compared to MERS S2P, which is the solid blue line where we saw a hundredfold increase in prefusion protein expression. And we saw the similar but slightly diminished effect uh, in SARS S2P compared to SARS S wild type, which is the dashed red. Um, so we looked at all of these samples by negative stain EM as well. Uh, again, this is in collaboration with the Ward Lab at Scripps. Uh, and when we looked at the MERS S wild type, we saw some of these 2D class averages corresponded to the prefusion confirmation that we would expect, but there were also these contaminating postfusion trimers, which sort of resemble a golf tee up at the top. However, when we looked at the MERS S2P sample, we didn't see any of these contaminating postfusion trimers, indicating that the proline mutations were having their intended effect and MERS was being stabilized in the prefusion confirmation. And we saw the same effect when looking at SARS S wild type compared to SARS S2P, where here we're seeing these contaminating postfusion trimers, whereas SARS S2P is entirely prefusion. Uh, so naturally, we tried to solve some of these structures at high res. Uh, we started with MERS CoV S2P. Uh, and when we were analyzing our cryo EM data, we noticed that rather than seeing just a single static structure, what we actually observed was four different confirmations of the prefusion state, which varied. Uh, depending on the confirmation or the position of these receptor binding domains shown in green. So on the far left, uh, we have the compact state, which is similar to the HKE1 structure that we observed. All these RBDs are, are packed closely to the C3 axis of symmetry, and they're forming that trimerization interface with the neighboring protomers. Uh, but the majority of the particles that we observed, about 65%, had a single RBD rotated up away from the rest of the spike, breaking that C3 symmetry. This was really exciting to us because it suggested that we were observing the biological confirmation that was accessible for receptor binding. Uh, about 30% of particles we observed with two RBDs in this up confirmation, and a very small portion of particles had all three RBDs up. And I've included a movie here, which hopefully plays, there we go, uh, to show this uh, sort of conformational change just morphing between the four different structures. So here it starts as all three RBDs down, and then you can see this RBD rotates using sort of a hinge-like motion away from S2 uh, up and allowing itself to become accessible to the host cell receptor. So to us, this was really interesting, not only because we thought we were observing the state that was accessible for host cell receptor binding, so a biologically relevant state, but we also hypothesized that this might serve as sort of an immune evasion mechanism for the coronavirus spike. Uh, the RBD contains a lot of potently neutralizing epitopes, and so when the RBD is down, it's potentially masking those neutralizing epitopes from the humoral immune system. Uh, it transiently and we think reversibly samples the up conformation, and if a host cell receptor is around, it will bind and trap that RBD in the up conformation. So based on these observations, we developed this model for how the coronavirus spike mediates viral membrane fusion. Uh, starting from the left, uh, on the surface of a virus, uh, spike exists as a metastable prefusion uh, trimer. Uh, it transiently and reversibly samples the RBD up conformation. Uh, if a host cell receptor is present, that RBD in the up conformation gets trapped by the high affinity binding interaction, and that allows other RBDs to subsequently become bound, gradually destabilizing the spike. Uh, eventually, the S1 subunit is shed, and the hydrophobic fusion peptide from S2 inserts itself into the host cell membrane, forming this highly unstable pre-hairpin intermediate. The instability of this intermediate state causes it to rapidly collapse to the post-fusion conformation, and that collapse brings together the host cell membrane with the viral membrane to form a fusion pore. And it's through this fusion pore that the viral genome can enter into the host cell and begin the process of replication. And so with that background out of the way, I'll start talking about the research that we have been performing over the past nine months since the COVID-19 outbreak started, um, starting with the termination of the structure of the prefusion state of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. Um, and before I get started, I want to acknowledge the work that was done by Dr. Nan Chuang Wong. You've already heard me mention his name. Uh, he has been really heavily involved in some of the formative work in this field, and he was also the co-first author on this publication with me. Uh, there is no way that we could have done it nearly as quickly without all of his help. Uh, so as you all know, in late 2019, a cluster of pneumonia uh, cases was reported in Wuhan, China. Uh, because of the symptoms associated with infection and some of the epidemiological circumstances surrounding the outbreak, early on it was thought that this might be a novel beta coronavirus emerging into the human population. Uh, 
Uh, that was confirmed on January 3rd of this year. And by January 14th, the sequence of that novel coronavirus, which was later renamed SARS-CoV-2, was released online. Uh, so as soon as that genomic sequence was released, Nan and I got to work designing equivalent 2P stabilizing mutations into this novel spike. Uh, by January 20th, Nan Chuang had our SARS-CoV-2 S2P construct cloned and sequence confirmed. Uh, we then transfected a half liter of mammalian cells, and five days later, we harvested our S2P purified protein. Uh, and here are the results of that purification here. Uh, you might be able to tell, unfortunately, the 2P mutations didn't give us quite the same dramatic effect that we observed in MERS and SARS-CoV-1, but we were able to purify an extremely pure prefusion product. You can see this band on the SDS page gel here. And when we ran that over SEC, we got a single symmetrical peak uh, at the expected molecular weight for a densely glycosylated prefusion trimer. Uh, so we took that sample down to our cryo-EM facility here at UT Austin. Um, we froze grids and fortunately, because we had worked on very similar spike proteins in the past, we were able to start collecting high resolution data that same night. Um, here's one of the early micrographs uh, and here are some representative 2D class averages from the first 100 movies that we collected. Um, based on these and some on-the-fly data processing in CryoSpark, we determined that orientation bias probably wouldn't be a limiting factor, and so we started a 24-hour data collection using Legion-On. Uh, as these data were being collected, we were processing the resulting micrographs in real time using WARP. Um, so WARP is a great program for those of you who haven't used it. Uh, it does the motion correction, CTF estimation, and particle picking all on the fly. Um, and I would highly recommend it. Uh, so after about 24 hours of data collection, we ended up with just over 3,000 micrographs, which were processed in warp. We then imported about 600,000 particles into CryoSpark for 2D classification. After sorting out junk, we had just over a quarter million particles left over, which were used as inputs to generate five ab initio 3D reconstructions. The resulting 3D reconstructions were then used as inputs for 3D classification. And with our final good particle stack, uh, we created two final reconstructions. One which had no symmetry applied, this 3.5 angstrom C1 reconstruction that had a single RBD in the up conformation. And then we artificially applied C3 symmetry uh, in order to uh, generate a 3.2 angstrom reconstruction with enhanced uh, map features in the S2 subunit to facilitate model building. And here is that model. Um, Two of the protomers we're showing as cryo-EM density in gray and white, and the third protomer is a ribbon diagram colored according to functional domain. Uh, hopefully you can tell that the protomer that we're showing as a ribbon has that RBD in green in the up receptor accessible conformation. Uh, so as I said, the, the ribbon diagram is colored according to functional domain with the N-terminal domain in blue, receptor binding domain in the up conformation in green. Uh, and then the S2 fusion subunit in these warm colors, except for the hydrophobic fusion peptide, which is shown as uh, cyan. Uh, and one thing I want to emphasize is uh, we're expressing the soluble ectodomain. So our construct spans residues 1 to 1208. Uh, and in our structure, we are only able to resolve up to about residue 1150, which is here in this purple connector domain. And the reason for that is because of the extreme flexibility of the heptad repeat 2 domain in the prefusion conformation. And I can show that a little bit here. Um, we processed these data in CryoSpark, as I said, so we got to take advantage of their 3D variability tool, which is really interesting in this data set in particular, because we can see this RBD sort of pivoting between the fully up conformation to almost down, but not quite C3 symmetrical. And we also see the really dramatic flexibility in the heptad repeat two domain, which prevented us from building a high resolution model for these uh, helices. Uh, so at this time, it had been reported that SARS-CoV-2 might share the same functional receptor as SARS-CoV-1, which is to say ACE2, um, although it had yet to be biophysically characterized. So we performed SPR to test ACE2 binding to our spike protein. At this time, it had not yet been named SARS-CoV-2, so it's, you'll see it referred to as 2019 NCOV in some of these figures. Uh, and what we found was that it bound to uh, this novel spike with about tenfold higher affinity than it bound to SARS-CoV-1, uh, about 15 nanomolar affinity. Uh, 
And we're also able to observe this complex by negative stain EM, I'm showing some of those 2D class averages here, with the globular ACE2 stacked on top of the prefusion trimer. Uh, because of the uh, relatively high degree of structural homology between the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, we wanted to test whether some SARS-CoV-1 RBD-directed monoclonal antibodies would potentially be cross-reactive against SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the event that we might be able to use them as COVID-19 therapeutics. Um, so to, to kind of illustrate some of that homology, I'm showing the SARS-CoV-1 RBD in white with the residues that vary mapped in red on the surface. And unfortunately, as you can probably see from our BLI sensorgrams down here at the bottom, none of the three monoclonal antibodies that we tested showed any cross-reactivity with the SARS-CoV-2 RBD. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't cross-reactive antibodies, and I'll get into that a little bit later, uh, but it did suggest to us that we would probably have to probe more carefully or more specifically using SARS-CoV-1 convalescent sera with SARS-CoV-2 probes or vice versa. And that is kind of a nice segue into the next section of my talk when I'll be talking about isolation and evaluation of immunotherapeutics directed against the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And I wanna acknowledge our collaborators, Dr. Dorian DeVleger from uh, Xavier Salenza's group at Ghent University, and also Dr. Anna Weck, who's a research scientist at Atomab. Um, so quick diversion, um, as you probably know, uh, in addition to producing conventional antibodies, camelids such as alpacas and llamas produce uh, uh, antibodies that lack a light chain or heavy chain only antibodies, which are sometimes called nanobodies or VHHs. Um, because of their reduced size, these nanobodies have some really interesting biophysical properties uh, such as enhanced thermostability, and they're also able to bind to small nooks and crannies that larger conventional antibodies might not be able to access. And because of this, there's quite a bit of interest in developing nanobodies as potential therapeutics. Um, for example, in 2017, our group in collaboration with Xavier Salenza's group at, uh, at Ghent University, uh, we elicited a couple of neutralizing antibodies against the RSVF protein. Um, this structure was solved by Morgan Gilman, who was a graduate student in our lab at the time. And it shows these two different nanobodies, VHH4 and VHHL66, which bound in very similar ways to sort of the equatorial region of the prefusion RSVF protein. Um, these two nanobodies also really potently neutralized. Uh, they're shown in blue and red here compared to palivizumab in pink, which is a uh, clinically approved monoclonal antibody, which is given for treatment of RSV, or RSV, excuse me. So based on this success with RSV, we tried to elicit some coronavirus specific nanobodies. Um, our initial goal was to try to elicit nanobodies which would be cross-reactive between SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. Uh, and so our immunization scheme was we first immunized with prefusion stabilized SARS-CoV-1S, uh, then MERS-CoV, then SARS again, and then a combination of the two spikes over the course of seven weeks, or excuse me, five weeks. And unfortunately, we were unable to isolate cross-reactive nanobodies, but we were able to elicit a bunch of potently neutralizing nanobodies which were specific for either SARS-CoV-1 or MERS. So we went about trying to solve the structures of these things in complex with their targets so we could figure out the mechanism of neutralization. And we started with this MERS-specific nantibody, VHH55. Uh, this was a crystal structure which was solved by Gretel Torres, who's a graduate student at Dartmouth College. Um, here we're showing VHH55 in blue ribbons uh, bound to the MERS-CoV RBD in tan with the receptor binding interface shown in red. And as you can see from this box that I'm highlighting, the CDRs of VHH55 sort of overlay nicely right on the receptor binding interface, causing clear steric hindrance if the receptor were to bind. And to illustrate this another way, I'm showing our co-crystal structure aligned to the previously determined co-crystal structure of the MERS-CoV RBD bound by DPP4, which is shown as a red molecular surface. And we also isolated a potently neutralizing SARS-CoV-1 directed nanobody, VHH72, uh, which we found neutralized in the same way, actually. Um, However, rather than binding directly to the ACE2 binding interface, it bound more to our, sort of this base of, uh, the, of the RBD. Um, here's the ACE2 binding interface in red, SARS-CoV-1 RBD is in pink. Um, and if you look, what's actually causing the clash with the receptor is this conserved framework of VHH72. 
And that was really fortunate for us because this base domain, or sort of the base of the receptor binding domain is the more conserved portion of the protein. Uh, so when SARS-CoV-2 emerged into the human population, uh, we predicted based on the binding epitope of VHH72 that it might be cross-reacted between the two closely related viruses. Uh, and we predicted that based on this alignment here. Uh, our crystal structure is uh, blue and pink, and then I'm mapping the SARS-CoV-2 variant residues in green. There's just this one mutation in the binding interface. So we tested our hypothesis by SPR, and we found that VHH72 bound to the SARS-CoV-2 RBD with about 40 nanomolar affinity in this sensorgram here. Uh, we also found by aligning our co-crystal structures to the cryo-EM structures of these spike ectodomains that not only would VHH72 block by or neutralize by blocking receptor binding, but it would also trap the RBD in the up conformation. You can see all of the clashes that would be formed with the RBDs down. So VHH72 would not only clash with other copies of itself bound to neighboring protomers, but it would also clash with the S2 subunit underneath. Um, so effectively, VHH72 would be acting as a receptor mimic, trapping the RBD in the up conformation and gradually destabilizing it until it prematurely triggered uh, and neutralized the virus. So if you remember from a couple slides back when I'm showing that cross-reactive binding between VHH72 and SARS-CoV-2 RBD, we saw a pretty fast off rate. So to try to overcome this, we engineered a bivalent FC fusion protein. Uh, fortunately, we saw a very tight binding of that FC fusion protein to the SARS-CoV-2 RBD. Uh, when we tested that FC fusion protein uh, for neutralization of SARS-CoV-2 pseudoviruses, we saw a potent neutralization as evidenced by this curve here. Uh, and it also produces extremely well in cell culture. Um, we're currently testing this in preclinical trials in hamsters, and we're optimistic that hopefully it will move on to clinical trials in humans as a potential therapeutic. Uh, so changing pace a little bit here, uh, during this time we're also collaborating with the biotech company Atomab to try to isolate cross-reactive antibodies. Uh, and the way that we were doing that was we had SARS-CoV-1 convalescent patient sera and we we're probing that sera using SARS-CoV-2 spike. Uh, we isolated 200 uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, interestingly, the plurality of these were from a single clonal lineage, this VH1-69 V kappa 2-30. Uh, the majority of those were IgGs, although we also isolated some IgAs. And so sort of whittling down these 200 monoclonal antibodies that we isolated, we settled on a final panel of 64, which we deemed high affinity. Um, for the purposes of these experiments, that was defined as uh, a parent KD of less than 10 nanomolar. Uh, and then we classified those 64 monoclonal antibodies based on their domain specificity. So about 25% of those were S2 binders, we found a lot of NTD binders, and about a third of them were receptor binding domain specific. Um, and within the receptor binding domain specific antibodies, we further classified them based on their competition with ACE2. So here in darker green, these are all the monoclonal antibodies we isolated that competed with ACE2. And when we compared neutralization potency to domain specificity, as you might expect, we found that the most potent neutralizers were the antibodies that competed with ACE2 and blocked receptor binding, which you can see here. Um, there's a couple of outliers, particularly there's an outlier that's an NTD potent neutralizer, um, but we have to still follow up on that a little bit. Um, to validate our um, sort of rough domain specificity. Um, we perform negative stain EM. Some of the 2D class averages from that is sh are shown at the top with the fabs pseudo colored. Um, just for example, I'm showing the 3D reconstructions from a couple of those down at the bottom with the spike, bind uh, the spike protein in white, uh, the ACE2 binding interface in red, uh, and then I've docked in homologous fabs from ADI 55689 and ADI 56046, which are the two most potent neutralizers that we isolated. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about uh, is our further prefusion stabilization engineering efforts. Uh, and these have really been spearheaded by a postdoc in our lab, Dr. Jinglin Shi, and a graduate student, Jory Goldsmith. I wish I could take more credit for this because it's a really cool story. Uh, it got published officially in Science this past week. Um, I was able to help out with some of the structural validation at the end, but I can't take too much credit for this. Uh, so referring back to our initial expression of the SARS-CoV-2 S2P protein, um, we got a very pure product which was stabilized in the prefusion confirmation, but from a liter of cells, we only got about a half mig of protein. Uh, 
Um, and because of the urgent need for large quantities of prefusion stabilized spike, Jory and Chinglin wanted to go ahead and see if they could improve upon our previous designs by using S2P as kind of like a starting base construct. Uh, and so they used the uh, SARS-CoV-2 S2P cryo-EM structure uh, as a guide to design 100 novel uh, stabilizing mutations, which they then exhaustively tested in small-scale expressions. Uh, a couple of their different design strategies here is a stabilizing salt bridge, which is engineered between the alpha helices of these two different protomers. Uh, they also tested some cavity filling mutations, such as this leucine to phenylalanine mutation. Um, they also tried to stabilize the spike by stapling flexible regions to less flexible regions using disulfide bonds. And then finally, they also inserted additional prolines uh, between the alpha helices making up S2. Uh, and after characterizing all of these different variants that they generated, they then combined successful variants to form double mutants, triple mutants, quadruple mutants. And finally, what they settled on was four additional proline mutations uh, using S2P as a base construct for a total of six prolines. So they're now referring to this construct as hexapro, although I've seen a couple of people in the literature now call it 6P. Uh, we solved the structure of this by cryo-EM to a resolution of 3.2 angstrom. Uh, and we were able to see that the SARS-CoV-2 hexapro monomer is, uh, or, sorry, I'm just showing a monomer here, but the structure of SARS-CoV-2 hexapro is pretty much identical to that of SARS-CoV-2 S2P, which is shown in white. Um, fortunately, the resolution of the S2 subunit was also of sufficient quality that we could see all of these proline residues that were inserted very clearly, and we could tell that they didn't have an effect on uh, the folding of the protein. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't specifically thank Thomas Edwards and Ulrich Baca and NCEF. Um, at the time, we were in a rush to collect these data, and our K3 was under maintenance, and they were able to help us out with the data collection. Uh, so that's sort of the structural validation, but here is all the really interesting biochemical work that went into characterizing these mutants. Uh, so starting on the top left, here's the S2P, which is our base construct, um, and combo 47 is the hexapro construct that we ultimately settled on. So as you can see from the uh, increased intensity of this band, we're getting much more prefusion protein using hexapro. Uh, that's a little bit easier to see from this SEC chromatogram. Again, combo 47 or hexapro is shown in green, and our S2P construct is shown in black. So we get about a tenfold increase in protein expression using hexapro relative to S2P. Uh, not only do we get that boost in expression, but Chinglin and Jory were also able to show a boost in thermostability from hexapro. So here we're showing the melting curves as determined by differential scanning fluorimetry. Again, S2P is in black. We see about this five degree shift in hexapro, which is in green. Uh, another really useful characteristic for us working in the lab uh, is that hexapro is more resilient to freeze-thaw cycles. Um, here is uh, some negatively stained hexapro particles after, I think this is three freeze-thaw cycles, although personally I think I've gone up to about five or six and we still see these really beautiful prefusion particles. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, is that we don't see any sort of antigenic difference between hexapro and S2P. Uh, these data were contributed by the Ippolito lab here at UT Austin. Uh, they took convalescent patient sera and tested it for binding in ELISA format. And you can see here hexapro between donor 117 and S2P are effectively identical, as are all these other paired donors. Uh, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab mates. Um, we, as I was saying to Sean before this started, probably about a third of the lab was focused on coronavirus research before this outbreak. But since then, I think everybody has kind of gotten their hands dirty. Uh, this has been a real team effort. I'd also like to thank our collaborators at the NIH from the Graham Lab, and again, the people at the NCEF. Uh, also our collaborators at Ghent, Adamab, and UT Austin. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Great, thank you for an excellent talk, Daniel. So uh, as I've said a couple of times, if you have any questions, just pass them in, uh, to me in the chat and I can ask them, or if you wish to raise your hand, I can unmute you so you can ask them yourself. So we have a few questions already. Great. I'm gonna read these probably word for word because this is not my area enough to know what I can embellish. Is ACE2 expression high enough to have multiple receptors near enough for several to bind a single spike? That is a really good question. Um, the short answer is I don't know, but there is some literature that suggests that uh, 
receptors are clustered on the viral surface by tetraspanins. Uh, there's also some evidence that those tetraspanins cluster Tempres2, which is the activating protease on the surface of host cells. Um, so again, short answer is I don't know, but there's some evidence that there might be receptor clustering. That being said, it's probably not necessary to have multiple uh, receptors bound in order to destabilize the spike. I think that may also answer the second question I had, which was referring to receptor density. How, not, how well does that correspond to expression? Are they clustered, essentially? I think you may have just answered that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Have you considered trying to identify pan beta coronavirus nanobodies or antibodies by focusing on, say, the S2 region because it has a higher sequence conservation? Uh, so that is sort of the goal. Uh, ultimately, one of the long-term goals of the lab is to try to develop pan beta coronavirus vaccines. Uh, and when we're doing that, we are mainly focusing on the S2 subunit because of the conservation in that subunit. Um, at the time when we were doing these immunizations, this was in 2016, uh, so we didn't really have good uh, S2 stabilized reagents, although now I'd be interested to try to re, uh, sort of uh, try again using our newly stabilized reagents. Got to find a new llama. Yeah, I've noticed there's a few groups working on uh, nanobodies. It'll be interesting to see how different the results they get. Across yeah, them. there was a, a very cool paper out in NSMB, um, I think just a couple of weeks ago, showing some pretty similar, I think they were actually cross-reactive nanobodies between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, similar to what we observed. Shifting gears a little bit to membrane fusion, could you say a little why you're thinking that the model is one RBD up, then two, then three, then hairpin, versus having each RBD transition to hairpin individually? Uh, that's a pretty good question. Uh, we've, seen, um, we've seen in RSV that these monomers do tend to sort of breathe and dissociate. Um, they, so they're not strictly maintained as that trimeric prefusion subunit at all times on the surface of a virus. We don't think that that's probably happening for coronaviruses just because the trimerization interface is so much more extensive and there's also that S1 cap. Uh, my guess is that what's happening is that S1 dissociates and at that point, all three simultaneously trigger because of the instability in S2. Um, and it's also, there's an important distinction that's sort of raised. It's probably not necessary to have uh, three ACE2 molecules bound in order for spike to trigger. Thanks. I have, someone has just asked another question, but I suspect uh, not terribly seriously. Given um, the current coronavirus and SARS, uh, Kobe one and MERS. If you had to guess, where, where are we going with this? I mean, are we looking at another novel coronavirus in the future? We uh, need to be focusing on these pan-inhibitory um, therapeutics. I think, unfortunately, the smart money is on coronaviruses continuing to emerge into the human population. Uh, and that's why there's so much interest in trying to develop these pan-beta coronavirus or pan-coronavirus inhibitors or immunotherapeutics. Um, but this has happened with SARS-CoV-1 in the early 2000s, then again with MERS in 2012. Um, so for the time being, it seems like this is going to continue happening. Yeah, unfortunately, I fear you might be right. So if anyone else has any further questions, just put your hand up or send us a message in the chat. Uh, if not, I'd just like to thank Daniel again for a really great talk and some really important work right now. And just to remind everybody that the next seminar is gonna be on the 29th of September, where we will be having a talk on the cryo-EM structure of the human GABA B receptor. Uh, so I would definitely come back for that one. I think that'll be very interesting again. So one last time, thank you very much for speaking and thank you all for joining. Thanks for having me.